Kate Middleton recently announced doctors found cancer during a planned abdominal surgery. She hasn't shared what type of cancer was found or its stage so naturally the world is guessing what's going on with Princess Kate and how serious her condition is. At the end of the video I'll give you my best guess based on what we know. But to start I'd like to take this opportunity to discuss abdominal cancers, who is most likely to get them, and also how cancer is staged as well as treatment options. First we need to look at the many abdominal organs that can possibly develop tumors. Inside the abdomen, also known as the peritoneal cavity we have intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal organs. The peritoneum is a thin membrane that lines the abdominal cavity and separates the intraperitoneal organs from the retroperitoneal organs. The peritoneal cavity contains the omentum, ligaments, and the mesentery. The intraperitoneal organs are the stomach, spleen, liver, parts of the small intestine, the transverse colon, and the sigmoid colon. The retroperitoneal organs are the kidneys, pancreas, adrenal glands, parts of the small intestine, the ascending and descending colon, appendix, ureters, esophagus, and aorta. Basically, the abdomen contains a lot of organs. So abdominal cancer could mean many things. At this point, we should note, the uterus, ovaries, fallopian tubes, cervix and bladder are pelvic organs. So we can exclude these organs when considering abdominal cancer. Now, given Kate Middleton's current age and lifestyle, there are a lot of possibilities as to what cancer she may have. So with limited information, it's hard to guess. Let's try to narrow it down. The only facts we know are that she had abdominal surgery and she is now undergoing some sort of preventive chemotherapy. This suggests whatever cancer Princess Kate has was able to be surgically removed or resected and is responsive to chemotherapy as opposed to having radiation therapy. This information automatically eliminates any type of leukemia. We are looking at solid tumors. Let's quickly break down the types of cancer starting from the more common types. First, we have colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer, also frequently referred to as colon cancer, is a major health concern impacting both men and women, typically affecting those over 45. While risk factors like family history can play a role, regular screenings are crucial for early detection. The colon is the largest part of the large intestine. If you were to stretch it out in a line, it would be about five feet long, the length of a queen-size bed. Common symptoms of colon cancer to watch for include blood in the stool, persistent abdominal pain, and unintentional weight changes. Diagnosis often involves a colonoscopy, allowing physicians to examine the colon for polyps or cancerous growths. Fortunately, colorectal cancer has a high success rate when caught early. The treatment options such as surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy are readily available, and advancements in medicine are continually improving patient outcomes. While not commonly occurring in people below age 50, the prevalence of colon cancer amongst patients in their 40s has been increasing. This is definitely a possibility. Risk factors include things like family history, age, smoking, alcohol intake, a diet high in red meat, and processed foods, obesity, a lack of physical activity, and more. While Princess Kate probably doesn't have a lot of these risk factors, colon cancer really can pop up in anyone. Rectal cancer is a type of cancer that develops in the rectum, the last six inches or so of the large intestine that connects the colon to the anus. It falls under the broader category of colorectal cancer, along with colon cancer, since both originate in the large intestine and share many similarities. Rectal cancer typically starts from abnormal growths called polyps in the rectum's inner lining. These polyps are usually benign non-cancerous but can turn cancerous over time. Risk factors include age over 45, a family history of colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, and certain genetic conditions along with smoking, alcohol intake, a processed diet, etc. Symptoms of rectal cancer or masses include rectal bleeding, changes in bowel habits, abdominal pain, tenesmus which is a feeling like you need to have a bowel movement but nothing comes out, and unexplained weight loss. The same as colon cancer, a colonoscopy, where a doctor examines the rectum and colon using a lighted tube, is the primary diagnostic tool. Biopsies will be taken for further analysis if any polyps or masses are found. Treatment options depend on the stage of the cancer. Surgery is often the mainstay of treatment, sometimes combined with radiation therapy or chemotherapy. In some cases, targeted therapy medications may be used. When detected early, rectal cancer has a high cure rate. Early detection is crucial for better outcomes, so regular screenings including colonoscopies are recommended for everyone and especially those at average or higher risk. Rectal cancer could be a possibility for Kate Middleton. Next is anal cancer. Anal cancer is often associated with high-risk human papillomavirus infection and is often locally excised unless it's already known to be more advanced and spread to the lymph nodes. So although this could affect Kate at her age, it doesn't seem likely given the information we know at this point. 
because an anal cancer resection would not have been approached abdominally from the start, and she had a planned abdominal surgery. Kidney cancer, also known as renal carcinoma, is a cancer that forms in the kidneys. Kidneys are the bean-shaped organs near your middle back that filter waste products from your blood to produce urine. Kidney cancer can strike at any age, but it most often develops in adults over 60. While both men and women can get it, men are statistically slightly more likely to develop kidney cancer. Smoking is also a big risk factor. Kidney cancer is often called a silent disease because it may not cause any noticeable symptoms in the early stages. However, as the tumor grows, some potential signs to be aware of include blood in the urine, also known as hematuria. This can range from barely noticeable to bright red blood, a persistent pain in the side below the ribs, a lump or mass in the lower back or side of the abdomen, unexplained weight loss, night sweats or fever, high blood pressure, and feeling constantly fatigued. The course of treatment for kidney cancer depends on the stage and grade of the cancer. Surgery is the mainstay treatment, especially for early stage tumors. The type of surgery depends on the tumor's size and location. In some cases, the entire kidney may be removed, a which is a radical nephrectomy, while other situations might allow for removing only part of the kidney, which is a partial nephrectomy. A renal ablation is a minimally invasive procedure and uses heat, cold, or radiofrequency waves to destroy cancer cells. Immunotherapy can be used to help your body's immune system recognize and attack cancer cells. And targeted chemotherapy involves giving drugs that target specific vulnerabilities in cancer cells. The outlook for kidney cancer highly depends on the stage of diagnosis. Early detection is crucial for a successful outcome. Thankfully, early-stage kidney cancer has a very high cure rate with treatment, with a five-year survival rate exceeding 90%. However, if cancer has spread to nearby lymph nodes or distant organs, the survival rate decreases. Regardless of the stage, treatment can still help manage the disease and improve quality of life. Next, we have cancer of the appendix. Appendix cancer, also referred to as appendiceal cancer, is a rare type of cancer that forms in the appendix. The appendix is a small, finger-shaped pouch attached to the large intestine in your lower right abdomen. While its exact function is not fully understood, it's believed to play a role in the immune system. Appendix cancer can develop at any age, but it most commonly affects adults between the ages of 40 and 60. It's more common in females than males, although the reason for this difference is not entirely clear. Given the little bit of information we have, appendiceal cancer is definitely a possibility though it's rare like we mentioned earlier. Appendix cancer is often difficult to diagnose in the early stages because the symptoms can be vague and mimic other conditions. Symptoms may include persistent abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, unexplained weight loss, abdominal swelling or bloating, fever, difficulty passing gas, and changes in bowel habits. Due to its rarity, there's no single standard treatment approach for appendix cancer. The course of treatment typically depends on the stage and grade of the cancer. Surgery is the primary treatment for appendix cancer, usually involving removal of the appendix and potentially surrounding lymph nodes to check for cancer spread. In advanced stages, additional surgery may be needed to remove other parts of the abdomen. Chemotherapy may be recommended after surgery, particularly in cases where the cancer has spread. Radiation therapy may be used in some cases in combination with surgery or chemotherapy. Outcomes for appendix cancer depend heavily on the stage of diagnosis. Early detection is key for a better prognosis. When caught in the early stages, the five-year survival rate for appendix cancer can be quite high, exceeding 90%. However, if the cancer has spread to other organs, the survival rate decreases significantly. Remember, appendix cancer is uncommon, but it's important to be aware of the potential symptoms, especially persistent abdominal pain. Early diagnosis is critical for the best outcome. Next is pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is a type of cancer that forms in the pancreas, a gland located behind your stomach that plays a vital role in digestion and blood sugar control. The pancreas produces enzymes that help break down food in the intestines and it also releases hormones like insulin and glucagon, which regulate blood sugar levels. Pancreatic cancer can strike at any age, but it most commonly affects people over 65. Smoking is a major risk factor for pancreatic cancer. Smokers are two to three times more likely to develop the disease compared to non-smokers. People with a history of type 2 diabetes also have an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. Having a close relative like a parent, sibling, or child with pancreatic cancer increases your risk. Long-term inflammation of the pancreas, like chronic pancreatitis, can also raise your risk. And as with a lot of cancers, being overweight or obese is a potential risk factor. Pancreatic cancer can be difficult to detect in the early stages because the pancreas is located deep within the abdomen. However, 
Some potential signs to be aware of include Abdominal pain, especially in the upper left abdomen that radiates to the back, unexplained weight loss and loss of appetite, yellowing of the skin and eyes known as jaundice, oily stools that float, new onset of diabetes or worsening of existing diabetes, blood clots and fatigue. There is no single standard treatment approach for pancreatic cancer, as the course of treatment depends on the stage and grade. The most common treatment for early stage pancreatic cancer is surgery to remove all or part of the pancreas, depending on the tumor's location and size. In some cases, nearby lymph nodes may also be removed. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and palliative care for managing symptoms and improving quality of life if a cure is not an option are also available. Early detection is essential for a better prognosis. Unfortunately, pancreatic cancer is often diagnosed in later stages when the cancer has already spread. The five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is low, but it improves significantly when caught in the early stages. I doubt Kate has or had pancreatic cancer. She doesn't seem to have the risk factors or behaviors that put you at risk for pancreatic cancer. Next up is stomach cancer, also known as gastric cancer, which is a malignancy that forms in the stomach, a muscular sac-like organ in your upper left abdomen. The stomach plays a key role in digestion by breaking down food into a liquid mixture for absorption by the intestines. Now, who gets stomach cancer? Stomach cancer can develop at any age, but it's more prevalent in adults over 55. There are several risk factors associated with stomach cancer. First is a Helicobacter pylori, also known as H. pylori, infection. Chronic infection with this bacteria is a major risk factor. Also, a diet high in smoked meats, processed meats, red meat and salty foods, and low in fruits and vegetables, can increase risk. Smokers are also more likely to develop stomach cancer compared to non-smokers. Being overweight or obese is a potential risk factor. Long-term chronic acid reflux can increase risk as well as infection with Epstein-Barr virus, the virus that also causes mono. Lastly, stomach polyps are precancerous growths that can develop into cancer if left untreated. Early stomach cancer often doesn't cause any noticeable symptoms. However, as the cancer progresses, some potential signs to be aware of include persistent heartburn or indigestion, abdominal pain, especially in the upper abdomen, feeling full or bloated after eating even a small amount, nausea and vomiting sometimes with blood difficulty swallowing, and unexplained weight loss and loss of appetite. The course of treatment for stomach cancer, like most other solid tumors, depends on the stage and grade of the cancer. Surgery is the mainstay treatment for early-stage stomach cancer, often involving partial or complete removal of the stomach. In some cases, nearby lymph nodes may also be removed. In very early stage cancers, endoscopic procedures may be used to remove the tumor or polyps. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy may be used as needed if surgery is not curative. Early detection is essential for a better prognosis. The five-year survival rate for early stage stomach cancer can be high, exceeding 90%. However, if the cancer has spread to other organs, the survival rate decreases significantly. Up next is adrenal cancer. Adrenal cancer is a rare type of cancer that develops in the adrenal glands. It most often affects adults around 40 to 50 years old and women are slightly more likely to have adrenal cancer. The adrenal glands are two small glands located on top of your kidneys. They produce hormones that help regulate many important bodily functions including blood pressure, blood sugar levels, and the body's response to stress. Adrenal cancer accounts for only about 0.2% of all cancers diagnosed each year. There are two main types of adrenal cancer. Adrenocortical carcinoma is the most common type of adrenal cancer. It starts in the outer layer of the adrenal gland, called the adrenal cortex. Theochromocytoma is a type of cancer that can start in either the adrenal cortex or the inner layer of the adrenal gland, which is called the adrenal medulla. Theochromocytomas can be benign or malignant. The symptoms of adrenal cancer can vary depending on the type of cancer and whether it is producing hormones. Some possible symptoms of adrenal cancer include unexplained weight gain or weight loss, fatigue, muscle weakness, pain in the abdomen or back, high blood pressure, high blood sugar levels, excessive hair growth in women or children, deepening of the voice in women, shrunken testicles in men, and skin changes, such as darkening of the skin or the appearance of purple stretch marks. Treatment for adrenal cancer typically involves surgery to remove the adrenal gland containing the tumor. In some cases, radiation therapy or chemotherapy may also be used. The outlook for people with adrenal cancer depends on the stage of the cancer at the time of diagnosis and other factors. Early-stage adrenal cancer can often be cured with surgery. However, advanced-stage adrenal cancer is more difficult to treat. Liver cancer is next. Liver cancer risk increases with age, with the majority of cases diagnosed in older adults. 
In the United States, the average age of diagnosis is around 63. However, it's important to note that liver cancer can occur at any age. There's a rare type called fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma that is more common in young adults, typically under 40, and often affects people with otherwise healthy livers. The main risk factors for liver cancer are chronic viral hepatitis, which is associated with chronic infection hepatitis B or the hepatitis C virus. These infections can damage the liver over time, increasing the risk of cirrhosis which can lead to cancer. The presence of cirrhosis is a major risk factor regardless of the cause. Cirrhosis can be caused by chronic hepatitis, heavy alcohol use, or other conditions. Long-term excessive alcohol consumption can damage the liver and increase cancer risk. Obesity and type 2 diabetes can contribute to fatty liver disease which can eventually progress to cirrhosis and increase cancer risk. Having a close relative with liver cancer slightly increases your risk. Lastly, exposure to aflatoxins, produced by mold on some foods, and exposure to certain industrial chemicals can increase risk. Liver cancer symptoms often don't appear until the later stages of the disease. In some cases, there might not be any noticeable symptoms at all. However, some common signs to watch out for include things like unintended weight loss, pain in the upper right abdomen or around the right shoulder blade, loss of appetite, swelling or bloating in the abdomen that doesn't go away, feeling full after a small meal, feeling a hard lump below the ribs on the right side, yellow skin, itchy skin, and fatigue. Treatment options for liver cancer depend on the stage and other factors. If the cancer is localized and hasn't spread, surgery to remove part or all of the liver may be an option. In some cases, a liver transplant may be considered, particularly for patients with small tumors and significant liver damage. An ablation is a minimally invasive technique that uses heat, cold, or other methods to destroy tumors. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy may be used as needed for treatment as well. Now let's move on to cancer of the spleen, also known as splenic cancer. Splenic cancer is uncommon. It occurs when abnormal cells develop and multiply rapidly in the spleen, an organ located on the left side of your upper abdomen that's part of your lymphatic system. There are two main types of spleen cancer. Primary spleen cancer is very rare. It starts in the spleen itself. The most common type of primary spleen cancer is called splenic marginal zone lymphoma. Secondary spleen cancer is much more frequent. It happens when cancer spreads to the spleen from another part of the body. Cancers that commonly spread to the spleen include lymphomas and leukemias, both of which are blood cancers. Other cancers like breast, lung, or colon cancer can also spread to the spleen, but it's less common. I do not highly suspect this one in Princess Kate's situation. Now, cancer of the small intestine is a relatively rare type of cancer that develops in the small intestine as opposed to the large intestine. The small intestine is responsible for absorbing nutrients from the food you eat. As mentioned previously, small intestine cancers can take a few different forms. Here's a deeper dive into the four main types. Adenocarcinoma is the most common type of small intestine cancer, accounting for roughly one-third of cases. It originates in the glandular cells that line the inner surface of the small intestine, responsible for secreting digestive enzymes and absorbing nutrients. Adenocarcinomas can develop anywhere in the small intestine, though they are more frequent in the duodenum and jejunum, which are the first two sections of the small intestine. Carcinoid tumors are a subtype of neuroendocrine tumors that develop from hormone-producing cells scattered throughout the digestive system. Carcinoid tumors in the small intestine are usually slow-growing and often remain confined to the intestinal wall for a long time before spreading. They can sometimes produce hormones that cause symptoms like flushing, diarrhea, and wheezing. Carcinoid tumors are most commonly found in the ileum, which is the last section of the small intestine. Lymphomas are cancers originating in the lymphatic system, a network of tissues and organs that helps fight infection. The lymphatic system has lymphoid tissue throughout the body, including the small intestine. Lymphomas can be Hodgkin lymphoma or non-Hodgkin lymphoma. While they can start anywhere in the body, lymphomas involving the small intestine are not as uncommon as other types. Gastrointestinal stromal tumors are tumors that arise from the connective tissues within the walls of the digestive tract, including the small intestine. These tumors can be benign non-cancerous or malignant cancerous. The exact cause of gastrointestinal stromal tumors is unknown, but a specific gene mutation is found in many cases. They can occur anywhere along the digestive tract, but the small intestine is a relatively common location. Carcinoid tumors are generally slow-growing, while adenocarcinomas and lymphomas can be more aggressive. Stromal tumors can vary in growth rate. Carcinoid tumors are unique in their ability to produce hormones, potentially causing specific symptoms. Small intestine tumors can be found via imaging like CT scans or MRIs, 
or often with an upper endoscopy or capsule endoscopy or capsule endoscopy where a camera is ingested and records images through the GI tract. Small intestine tumors are surgically removed and chemotherapy may be used after surgery if the surgery is not curative. Adenocarcinomas tend to affect people aged 60 and over, while carcinoid tumors and gastrointestinal tumors are more likely to affect younger adults in their 40s. The last abdominal cancer I'm going to cover today is urethral cancer. Urethral cancer, also sometimes called urethral carcinoma or renal pelvic cancer, is a cancer that develops in the ureters. The ureters are two thin tubes that carry urine from the kidneys to the bladder. It's a relatively uncommon cancer, accounting for only about 1-2% to of all genitourinary cancer. The most common type of urethral cancer is transitional cell carcinoma, the same type of cancer that often affects the bladder. While the exact cause is unknown, some factors can increase the risk. Smoking is a major risk factor as it exposes the urinary system to harmful carcinogens. Long-term exposure to certain chemicals or past radiation therapy in the pelvic area can irritate the lining of the ureters, increasing cancer risk. Individuals with a history of bladder cancer have a higher risk of developing urethral cancer. Urethral cancer most commonly affects older adults. The risk increases with age, with most cases diagnosed in people in their 70s and 80s. So there's our summary of the more common abdominal cancers. There are quite a few possibilities as to what kind of cancer Princess Kate has. It may be one of those on this list, or it may be something a little more rare and less common. I can see something like an adrenal cancer or some sort of small or large intestine tumor in Princess Kate's case. She does seem to have lost a lot of weight so that would support something like an adrenal pheochromocytoma, but maybe it's also the stress of surgery and the cancer diagnosis causing the weight loss. Either way, I do hope Princess Kate caught whatever it is early and is able to undergo curative treatment that will lead to a long healthy life.